and welcome back to the Talk Past podcast. As I always try to make some weird rhyme out of that. But mm -hmm. I am here, of course, uh, with a wonderful friend and guest. Uh, you can introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Angela Rodenfels. Um, I do a lot of uh, community theater type acting and, uh, of course, sew and create everything I wear for those. Indeed, which is awesome. And I am the occasional host, occasionally in every video. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought we would go down uh, a little bit in the sense of, of the festival videos that we've been doing, the festival stories where we talk to some of our, our SMF friends who are also friends that do other shows and cons, et cetera. I'm going to go down that, uh, that, that little road. So uh, obviously we we've done SMF together, um, the medieval festival, but you do so much more. Uh, you, you've done I, cons as well. Yeah. I done uh, Sarasota medieval fair. I did it for many years straight. Mm -hmm. from, since 2012 um and then i i branched off in i think it'll be my fourth no i've done three years of metrocon the anime convention up in tampa uh i had done previously while it was still going on uh about three years three or four years of um fort myers beach pirate festival because my husband did the gunpowder crew there so I did uh, one of the, the lane characters and helped with the uh, gun show. Oh, where was that? Because I uh, did I did the, the West Coast Mutineers up in Madeira ah, Beach. Yeah. So obviously that's different, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was Fort Myers Beach, which is like a little island right off Fort Myers. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's my husband's hometown. Um, nice. And a lot of folks, like, a lot of the people you see, like, who work security at MetroCon or do a bunch of, you'll see the people who showed up at that pirate festival at medieval fairs and events all through the area. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we we're all, we're a very small community despite mm -hmm. being obviously global. Like uh, up here, I still, although I have not gone to King Richard's fair, you know, I know a good portion of people that are doing it. So it's nice. a very small community. Yeah. Uh, you know, doing done the the acting and uh stunt combat for metrocon um and just acting for and the gun show for fort myers beach pirate fest and uh, that that pirate show sort of interrupt but i got a, a quick question sure, on sure. that um do you guys do you know, like historical or is it like pirates of the caribbean because it's... when i did go ahead well um right now like they fort myers beach actually like the uh, the the Chamber of Commerce, that's what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. actually stopped it about a couple years ago. And uh, our fabulous Admiral Belinda uh, has been trying to find a new, better location for us. But when it happened, it was very much like it, we cordoned off one whole big street that led to the water and yeah. along the dock. And we had a beautiful uh, pirate setup where it was everyone dressed as authentically as they possibly could. Um, we had a, a, a Lord general of the town. He actually married us at my wedding. Yeah. Um, and a very nice historical setup for the pirate encampment. And the rest of it was us just acting and running around as the crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause, um, when I did West coast, I think it was only, I think maybe two years. I want to say, um, same same exact description as you're you're saying, yeah. and literally same thing happened too, where they just kind of stopped doing the show, and yeah. uh, they've been trying to bring it back up, but eh, I don't know. Pirates are kind of phasing out, and now everyone wants to do pirates if they're called Vikings. Well, and, um, it's yeah, it it's really one of those things where you have to have the perfect location yeah. for showcasing the pirate show which is like somewhere close to the water but still accessible by people to park yeah. and a wide enough area to do things and of course the cooperation of the businesses around so that's a it's not the same as a medieval fair where you can find a field and, yeah um, no <laughs> um, it was so weird like our our encampment obviously the smf people mm -hmm. were the only historical camp um, to my knowledge, because right across from us was someone with a, a standee of Johnny Depp throwing darts at him. 
And, yeah, um, that was uh, that was not Fort Myers Beach. Uh, we no. did, yeah, we did had a lovely crew with some. I think they also did Civil War reenactments. As far as they had these cannons the size of smart cars, mm-hmm. it was incredible. Got to fire yeah. one off at my wedding. That was great. Nice. It's, <laughs> um, it's so weird and kind of jarring when you're trying to be like a historical character, mm-hmm. and you're walking between a a gumbo restaurant and a sun a beach store sunglasses yeah. shop. And yeah. it's like, uh huh. And it, I mean, that's why the land actors matter. You got to pull that person into your world for even yeah. just a minute, and all of a sudden they they feel it, even if they're next to a Johnny Depp. <laughs> yes, or or I guess in a, in terms of Viking, I, I know Jorvik uh, Viking Center is doing their show very soon. But you look mm. at the videos there in I think it's Scotland, um, mm. which is amazing. But you look at them, and honestly, that is a much better setting because it's the actual place that they were. Oh at. yeah, oh so yeah. You, Trying you to do anything some, in the U.S. is <laughs> some castles or whatnot, but you just looking at them, they're on a pavement street. There's there's stores and and restaurants nearby too, so it's so difficult to find a place to do something mm-hmm. that's appropriately historical, especially if it's mm-hmm. medieval or or beyond yeah. in terms of like further back. Yeah, just trying to get that immersion for your audience when mm-hmm. you're having to deal with, you know, a real world town <laughs> it exactly. is so hard. Um, it, that, that's yeah. the same complaint, though, that I would have of SMF. Mm-hmm. Um, only recently, obviously, you know, from mm-hmm. from doing the show with me that I throw historical accuracy completely out the window mm-hmm. uh, with everything I did. But uh, as opposed to more recently, where I've kind of awakened to be like, wait a minute, I'm wrong. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's but, something uh, where it's, you, you want to put on a good show when the show's the focus, but when you can mm-hmm. really just enjoy being as historically accurate in a thing as possible, mm-hmm. that's kind of why I'm like, hmm, maybe I try to do a reenactment tent at a Sarasota Medieval Fair if they uh, yeah. get me a spot. That would be really cool to to set up like a... A little tent where I'm just showcasing. Okay, this is the the seamstress's tent. Yeah, I I have the pattern pieces cut out, and you see looms and the tools all set up. And actually, like having that diorama, even if every inch of the fair can't be good, I, that's why I liked seeing the the lanch connects with the Vikings at the medieval fair because they have the resources and the time to yeah. make a beautiful setting when a fair that's trying to cover everything budget wise can't do that at, at, at least not in a short period of time they, they right. can do their best uh, so oh, yeah, having yeah. smaller groups like build up is always is always nice yeah no you just uh, i would definitely support that i i myself um you know i liked the the encampments obviously weird vikings we had and and dragon head mm-hmm. productions um yeah. or studios i always forget which one well they're they're the same thing in terms yeah, of yeah i know what you mean studio. yeah accurate. but Walking through their their areas, obviously Weird Vikings had a much smaller setup, but they still had period setup. And then yes. obviously walking through Dragonhead's area was a much larger area. It was a more of an encampment. It was a more immersive mm-hmm. setting. And yet, although I know we try with that tiny little roped off area, a mm-hmm. lot of the guests go past the rope and they chill there, and and it just doesn't it it doesn't me- measure up. And it's... and then. I think uh, that can really make like, okay, how do you want the audience interacting? Do you want them to be able to sit and watch you work? In that case, maybe you need some benches in front. Do you yeah, want do we want to bring in living history or do we want to, you know? Yeah, I it really is something where it's like, do you want we've got to make places for people to hang out around if not within, like around the areas that this stuff's happening. Otherwise it doesn't feel like a place you're supposed to stand still. It's, yeah, it's backdrop. I mean, uh, it, it doesn't feel exactly. interactive. Yeah, uh, like like uh, it, it it to me. I think what you're trying to say is it it allows you to get into the immersion of the experience mm-hmm. we're trying to portray, as opposed yeah. to. And I can only reference the old site. I don't know what the new one is like yet at the moment. But the old one, we had that river, and then once yeah. you got into the Chessfield area, then things started getting actually period looking. With exception there, of the chess field. This um, this year's definitely like things are more spread out because they're dealing with 
larger a, land. a larger space and they don't have i think some of the the weirdness i saw there this past uh couple weekends is they don't have the water and power laid out to as many places that as they would need in their mm-hmm. ideal situation like the the fairgrounds obviously had water and yeah. power laid out to a lot of different sections and they're planning to do that with sarasota but that's why the old food booths are in one section is because that's all the water and power and none of the other mm-hmm. booths have it. Uh, when that can expand, then you can get a lot more little areas. And I think trying to make little cul-de-sac type zones in a fair, rather than it just being a lane you walk through, I think is going to, is my suggestion, is grouping like things. So we are surrounded by beautiful, like um, very period things in one area. Exactly. And Try to make it more cul-de-sac-like rather than a line you walk through. It feels like a lane you're supposed to traverse rather than a place to stop and analyze and ask questions. When I was walking around the first weekend, I brought my little tablet loom about the length of my forearm. And I like bringing that out because I can just sit down in the middle of the dirt in the middle of a walkway and start doing it. And I had eight kids sitting in front of me. Within 20 minutes, looking at what I was doing and people stopping and looking and all of a sudden they were more immersed in what I was doing than people who are doing great things in reenactment tents along the way. But it's not in the middle of where this person is. And, it's, and, and you know, that's I mean, I'll, I would take a bullet for everyone there. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, I definitely came to the realization it is absolutely 100 percent a fantasy festival. It is yeah. absolutely a postmodern strawberry festival with people vaguely not really dressed up in medieval mm-hmm. outfits. Yeah, I, I, I think would love this... it to be historically accurate, like completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why I think having people who do engage in the, the as accurate as possible mm-hmm. and it is so important in those places because even if every inch of it can't be, the more of it you have, the more of it you build up, the more, I think it's the craftsmanship. I think that draws people in and makes them feel it, even in those settings. Yeah. Is if you see people doing leatherworking, if you see people doing uh, the blacksmithing, even if it's with exactly. slightly more modern equipment, then they 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 feel, okay, so this is how it things happened. And having more craftsmanship demonstrations throughout of various things even if it's like booths with food and things like that even if you're not selling it for people showcasing these are these are recipes this is what it looked like i i mean even if the next thing you stall you go to is like a fantasy vendor Mm -hmm. it's it makes it feel worth going there to get to see that even if it's not historically accurate it it lets you go back in time even when you're just standing in one booth. And exactly. it is and still ob- valid to do. Exactly. Obviously, and we'll move on from the topic because you brought up sure. something else to talk about. But obviously, just to cap that, you know, we'll, we'll always have guests that come in as cosplay from yeah. anime, from whatever they think medieval was, like mm-hmm. The Last Kingdom and Vikings to furries. So yeah. I, think, I think actually the furries tend to dress up more period extra. To, uh, what we do the amount of but, research um, they have to do for any inch of their costume i bet exactly exactly but in example of that you mentioned doing your tablet looming or looming mm-hmm. tablet whichever you said uh, yeah. so obviously i'm getting more deeper into the fabric the sewing the, yeah. the craft of the viking age whatever mm-hmm. the viking age was course the time period um i'm Mm -hmm. thinking always in terms of medieval period as like the ninth century but um they they had tablet tablet weaving um is it something similar or are you a little bit later period no uh tablet weaving is one of the oldest forms of weaving that we have physical evidence for like they found tablet cards still strung up on a viking Mm ship um and but that style i believe they're not quite sure exactly where it originated but it was mostly nordic up there but it had it eventually was part of all like europe it had spread all over they found 
evidence of something tablet woven in ancient Egypt, even though it's probably not where it originated, they they had it. They know what it was because it's a very simple, very portable way to make something pretty. And yeah. that's, I think, the essential reason why it became very ubiquitous a bunch of bunch of cultures is because unlike weaving on a big loom to make fabric, this is purely decorative. And it's something where you don't even need a loom. You just can strap the ends of your strings to your belt and strap the other one to a pole, literally anything. And you can weave and you can make an interesting pattern. All you need is a square of material, bone, wood, didn't particularly matter, and four holes. And you could make something that could be trim or a belt, it depended on the the thickness and the toughness of the fiber you were weaving through there. Yeah. And uh, for modern tablet weavers, we usually use um uh cotton thread, mm -hmm. the like cotton crochet thread. You'll see uh because it, it weaves very nicely and it lets you make a very clean pattern um as opposed to like a fluffy yarn. Yeah. Uh so yeah, I, yeah. I love how oh, portable oh. it is. Sorry. Continue. Oh, no, no, go ahead. You were talking. Yeah. Uh, I found looms for tablet weaving that just give you some pegs to, to wind the stuff around mm -hmm. and let you adjust the tension. Because if you do it the super, super basic way of like strapping it to yourself and strapping it to a pole, you're, you're stuck there until you're done. You can't really get up and leave because the moment you let the tension down, all your cards and your stuff will get tangled up. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have the time for that. No. Uh, there, no. there are lots of nice uh, artists on Etsy, and there's no one way to make a tablet weaving loom. Oh it's yeah, just... no, there's a there's a ton of different types of mm -hmm. looms. Like uh, the large one that probably most people think about when they think of like the Viking era. Mm -hmm. um that, that ginormous one where you're kind of making like a blanket and yeah there's also the tiny square one or yeah. literally just the bone needles yeah my little one i have that's about the length of my forearm can make about four foot about four and a half foot uh band when i'm done with it most of the time Ooh. i've got one that's a little bigger um uh and it's can make a six foot uh, but that's about as big as I can like take with me to work because yeah. I have downtime at work. Um, and I I enjoy the patterns. I recommend anyone trying to start doing this. Uh, there's there's a, yeah. a book on card weaving. I've got hold on, it's right here on my shelf. Um, by Candice Crockett because card weaving, tablet weaving are the same thing. Tablet weaving is what it's usually called but you know because we're americans a lot of times we call mm -hmm. it card waving so we use it interchangeably um start with the patterns that go all cards forward all cards back and that makes you can make very elaborate patterns doing that and you don't have to keep track of what you're doing with each individual card the really complicated ones they see that have the 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 dragons and the celtic knots and all that that's a pattern that'll go okay so for for this turn you're putting one through eight forward eight through ten back and so on and so forth different sections and then the next round you're doing a different one and you gotta remember where you are oh yeah that's a so that's too much does it is it because i've never done and i am interested in, in doing that i, I want to do obviously for the channel historically accurate methods of, of crafts i'm trying yeah. to to build I, up the courage to cut some wool to make a Viking pillbox, but how how um, when you're doing the looming, uh, weaving, sorry, uh, yeah. does it like take a long time? Is it is it, it a little bit? Is it something a beginner could just kind of get into very simply with a simple pattern? Yeah, with a simple pattern, yes. Um, Even if it's just like a line. Yeah, if you uh, look up on seeing if you if you get a, a tablet weaving loom, honestly, that's. If you're looking for the least stressful way to do this, if this is something you want to try to do, I recommend it because the loom also lets you keep your strings separate and exactly in the order you want. They're not going to get tangled up, which can be very frustrating if you try to do it the super traditional way of it, like 
between you and an object or between two poles. Things can yeah. get tangled up and it can be very frustrating. Yeah, um, yeah. So you're going to look at the large ones, um, oh. you know, the large wooden ones. Those look like an absolute tangled mess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, gosh, I wish I had the... Uh, I wish I had a name of it at the Etsy shop I got my my loom from. Um, well, if but... you remember by the time this goes up, this is going to go up in uh, January. I'm going to put this as the first week of January. Yeah. Uh, since I've already got the two episodes set for December. If you f- if you remember, just let me know. I'll put that in the description. Mm-hmm. And I'll put the um, Canada's Crockett book in the description, too. Yeah. Uh, the, t- the patterns for this are actually super accessible. You don't have to buy a book of patterns. Honestly, just go on Pinterest and uh look up tablet weaving patterns and it's a grid it's that's one of the reasons i like tablet weaving is it's so simple to read the pattern it's not like a knitting pattern where you have to know all the terminology it's practically written in another language this is a grid because there's four holes Mm -hmm. a b c and d and it'll show okay this color in this hole and you need to know like all right which color goes in which hole for that card and then you have an S or a Z on top. The S is you thread the card from the front of the card. You have to decide which one's the front of the card. And the Zs, you thread it, that hole from the back of the card. So you just need to know, okay, hole number A. Uh, okay, that's going to be a red thread threaded from the front. Okay. And you just, and that's it. There's like three things to know about any given way you tie it on. That's it. It's the longest part's warping the loom where you tie all the strings on because you're tying a lot of knots i had like Mm -hmm. recent one i did that was like a 26 card one with probably like 119 knots i tied which sounds like a lot but when you're like half listening to something so yeah it's up yeah oh yeah when i was doing leather crafting which i like doing i just don't do it enough Mm -hmm. i only ever really do it when i'm making something for someone so that's why they're always kind of amateur but um, mm-hmm. I always just throw like Little Mermaid on and then go to town. Yeah. Uh, always those little old Disney classics are my my craft. Yeah, uh, that background. background. Yeah. yeah. Um, once you've warped it onto your loom or onto whatever you've got the the strings, whatever's keeping them taut, the actual turning process and like putting the shuttle through and like tapping to go the back and forth, that mm-hmm. goes very quickly. Uh. And great thing is, if you're using a pattern where all the cards go forward or all the cards go back, there's only two options. So if you turn it and you're like, that doesn't look like the pattern it's supposed to be, you just undo that one bit, turn it the other way. Guess what? That had to be it. Because there's only two options. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to guess what went wrong. You just turn it the other direction. I generally can do the actual weaving of it while I'm listening to audiobooks or heck, even watching TV, as long as it's not like something I need subtitles for. And yeah, yeah. yeah, that's why I like doing it like in the lanes at fair, because I can be talking to a patron while I'm doing it and I don't have to worry that I'm going to mess it up. It's really quick. But yeah, it just kind of becomes second nature for you if you do it enough times. Mm-hmm. Oh, I found the card. Hold on. Oh, there you go. Wind, Wind Haven Fiber Tools is what I got this from. Um, they have, uh, oh, apparently... The one loom I got was called the mandolin. The smaller one was called the ukulele. Anyway, if you're trying to look up what those look like, that's uh, the best reference I can give for you. Uh, they were on Etsy. I think they also have their own website. Nice. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, are they like a local to uh, Florida? No, I got them on Etsy. I, I don't remember what state they're based in, but oh, they, touche, touche. they do a lot, of, a lot of weaving tools, but they're our small business. Nice. Which is obviously uh, support the local small businesses, uh, yeah. which is why I tend to, even though Etsy itself is like a corporation, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a great place to find, uh, obviously, small businesses, but local. Like, I don't, I've, I've only yeah. recently figured out they've got a filter that you can even drop it down to your, your uh, mm-hmm. zip code. And yeah. Hopefully someone that does what you're looking for is there. Um, mm-hmm. At least for us, usually they're around the corner. But uh it's a great place for for that. So I would definitely check that mm-hmm. out if you're listening. And uh, I'm going to take a look at that after the podcast, too. Yeah, I know as far as, like, reenactment and the the parallels I found doing a lot of cosplay, 
Mm Because when I do when I do perform for Metricon, which is an anime convention, honestly, the process of figuring out the costume as opposed to like a medieval one is fairly similar when you're looking at a, a reference drawn by some animator who's never sewn a thing in their dang life. And uh, you're trying to figure out where seams should go and what fabric it could possibly be made out of. Yeah, That's the like, same oh, this, thing. This yeah. looks cool. Let's just do that. And then you, you, you try to mm-hmm. like realize it and it's, uh, it's a no. Yeah. And so when you're trying to like make something for going to uh, like a SDA or trying to do something super historically accurate for reenactment stuff... You find yourself looking at tapestries going like, okay, where the heck are the seams? Are there gores here? Is that embroidery or is this woven? Like, what's going on? Like that medieval tapestry art? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm st- in the process of trying to figure out what... I want to try to make something super, like, hyper-historically accurate now that I'm at the mm-hmm. skill level I'm at. Yeah. Uh, of and what time frame? That's the question. It's like, I have to find mm-hmm. one that... I like, I want to do, I definitely want to do one that's very old, very right. old. And then I might do a couple of them through some different time periods. Uh, now that I actually have a store, can you believe it, in Sarasota that has not just a few bolts of wool fabric, an entire shelf, double-sided. Nice. Uh, nice. I, was, uh, I was shocked. That is not something you find in Florida no, at all. No, I've got a local farm here that I've been buying wool from. Mm-hmm. To to do some Viking outfitting, uh, and it's it's nice, especially here in a colder area. Having wool is mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's like I I would love to be able to visit more northern reenactment stuff because uh, mm-hmm. gotta say the motivation for working with some of the most historically accurate uh, fibers in Florida a little low. I uh, I can't blame some people in Florida for just not being willing to go the 100 percent historically accurate options because you would might die of heat stroke you gotta adapt it you gotta adapt it or oh yeah yeah like like for the regions that we've portrayed at least with the the festival obviously everything is pretty much uh western europe it's it's Mm -hmm. right on the coast of freezing town and so everyone wore linen and wool predominantly some cotton Mm -hmm. here and there But yeah, uh, the when you're in the fine. tropics, yeah, it's a little uh, difficult. So I think mostly, like I, I, I didn't wear wool at all in any way, mm-hmm. shape, or form. I'll be honest. I wore everything was pretty much linen, and uh, linen and and my my pants were always like a terum or polymer. I don't know how yep. that got through, but you know, so it's one I of those get... things people aren't going to be looking too closely at. So you're like, eh, they're scrub pants. Mm-hmm. Oh, and see, know, they're they're black. They're they're yeah. matte black. Which even that is is not historically accurate. The color black. Yeah, it's it's like I can crazy. I can sorry. Oh, I no can bad, accept sorry. I can accept people wearing like their sandler boots with their modern soles because I know what the muck they might be walking through. <laughs> like you need to protect your dang feet. Yeah, uh, just having yeah. that strip of leather or uh, a little bit of wood, something between your foot and the ground, as accurate as it might be, maybe not the safest. Yeah, because I mean, at least for the festival, it's the entire ground is just mulch, which is ridiculous. And mulch mm-hmm. is, is, it's hard to walk on. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I've got the sandlers, even though they are obviously anachronistic, they are the best kind of boots for reenactment. Yeah. Because they are the comfiest, they last forever, and, you know, they're, they're, they'll get you through anything. Whereas yeah, it, a turn shoe, maybe yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. This first weekend of Sarasota Medieval Fair, the the day before, it poured rain for the first time in weeks too. It poured rain, and so the first day you got there, and there were puddles, and like there was nothing more valuable on that site than someone walking by with a bag of mulch. Uh, and my sandlers, I walked through puddles, like big ones, because there's no other way. Yeah. They just hadn't built the grounds up enough yet, and uh, my feet stayed dry the whole time. Oh, exactly. A- absolute expert quality. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I mean, I'm sure we could probably build a, I don't know, but then it would be ac- anachronistic, but build a turn shoe of, of similar quality, but then yeah. going back okay. into reenactment territory. Yeah, if you try to, like, line it, the inside, something no one will ever see with yeah. something that'll actually, like, protect you, given whatever you're in. 
Exactly, so it is, exactly. it's a hard balance to choose strike with being practical in whatever setting you're in versus being as accurate as humanly possible. If you're just making mm-hmm. an art piece, like you're just making an outfit that is just meant to showcase techniques. It's not meant to necessarily be worn, worn around by you for a full day, like for a display piece. That can be very cool, especially if you have it hanging up in your reenactment tent. But what you're actually wearing around, I can forgive people more. Yeah, it's, it's a. Hard. I guess you would, you would call that a reenactorism, something yeah. that we we have we reenactors do. That's kind of like bending the rules, but we kind of have to do them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gotta do what you gotta do. Um, mm-hmm. but it 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 is kind of like a sport once you really start getting into how accurate can I possibly make this? Yes. Ah, yeah. your outfit is good, but I can think I can make those buttons even more accurate than yours. <laughs> or at least mm-hmm. like compete grab, with yourself from the past. Yeah, grab an article and and because I've got some articles uh from the academic sites that have such high quality and they're here on the Discord. Um if not I'll, I will post it. But um one is regarding a Viking hood. Mm-hmm. Or a hood of the Viking period that's kind of under under debate of whether it's it's Viking, quote unquote, or Sami or Sami, however you yeah. pronounce it. Um, so that's a big debate. But it has these really close up photos of the hood mm-hmm. that show you how they stitched it, the mm-hmm. dried patterning in the wool in the wool mm-hmm. that you can see and, and so many things that and a lot of people recreate this hood and everybody seems to do it inaccurately. But uh, yes, it is on the Discord. Um, it's the Skull to Ham one. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm mispronouncing that, but um, it's it's incredible the detail that you can get from an academic article that's actually made by people that are studying mm-hmm. it, as opposed to these weird clickbait articles that are just like Vikings in North America, bippity bop. Yeah. And we're just like, uh, well, we yeah. know that. Give me something better. Yeah, and I know it's hard. Like I remember trying to find resources for what I should be wearing when I was a performer for Medieval Fair because I'm not this year. I've just been attending. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that translates to to pirate as well as doing conventions. Yeah, but uh, as far as trying to figure out, okay, I'm gonna look up some photos of what medieval people wore, and you're like, that looks super cool. I like it. Find out that was uh, Scandinavian, not, not or it was like Slavic. Oh. There's no way that you would have been wearing that in medieval England, whatever setting yeah. you're in. And you're like trying to be like, okay, this is a cool tapestry. Nothing on this Pinterest is uh, dating or giving me a a geotag on this oh, tapestry yeah. was from. Was the person depicted in the tapestry from the area you were supposed to be depicting? It mm-hmm. can get really confusing because I'm like, yeah, I want to get more accurate medieval shoes. All the ones available are the turn shoes. It's like... Most of the ones I see depicted are like actually a copy of a historical shoe. Yeah. You're you're limited to like one region of the world. Yep. And so even if you're trying to like you're you're trying to be a a, a Scottish person uh, for reenactment, you might end up with pieces that are technically sourced from other other parts of Europe because the 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 resources you got don't don't describe well that that was something very specific to an area uh it it can get very frustrating trying to 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 nail down a look Uh, yeah no no i'm not gonna in any way shape or form insult anybody's look because of how difficult both it is to purchase with money and and find the resources because i mean i'll be completely honest i did very little actual historical fact checking and and resource looking into research mm-hmm. we'll say uh which is my own personal yeah ignorance um until of course recently where i'm like wait a minute i am interested in this stuff and mm-hmm. just just doing research for videos that'll be out uh this year for the channel i had to go into you know paywall academic articles yeah. that you otherwise nobody has access to Mm -hmm. Which makes no sense in terms of learning. If you want people to know the accurate, whatever Mm -hmm. you want to talk about, it shouldn't be behind a paywall. But it it Mm -hmm. really is very difficult to get the resources that we need, you Mm -hmm. and I, whether it's conventions or or a festival or living history or SEA, Mm -hmm. etc. 
to be as as accurate as possible. Whether you're doing Cinderella's dress and you're trying to do it accurate to when she would have existed, mm-hmm. uh, to uh, the the Romans. Yeah, it's, it's really weird how if you look it up online, you're the the mecca of information. Uh, everything is is the basic Hollywood interpretation of it. Yeah, which is not yeah. at all. Yeah, it's and that's why it's so refreshing when you find a period drama that really puts the effort. It like you can tell the the people went into it. Favorite yeah. example of uh, a period drama who actually like I want whoever did did this show to do a, every period piece ever because they're incredible. Um, the show Gentleman Jack. They do even just the opening sequence of her getting dressed in the morning. Every inch of every layer that they show that every person's wearing, including the like the everyday folk, which usually gets overlooked by uh, production, mm-hmm. is incredibly accurate. And I'm like, this, this is the level I want. Now translate this, someone, this to medieval. <laughs> this is someone that actually did their research. Yes, like oh, and time did time? not compromise with any of it like really put it in i'm just like you you're my here please yeah, what, uh, what time frame is it set in um that would be early victorian so it's okay. it's uh yeah early early victorian like when queen victoria was um crowned around that time uh, see i would be interested in seeing well I'm, I'm not a big fan of the victorian era myself um i don't know why it just never really stuck to me but yeah. I would be interested to see what resources there are to get those accurate information. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, the uh, there are actually sewing books like written of that era and more extant garments. So it's mm-hmm. so many more resources, which yeah, is why, like, I keep finding like 16th century medieval sewing. I'm like, cool. What if I want to be earlier than that? <laughs> yeah, because I mean, the when you look at another opposite example, which is Vikings, the TV show mm-hmm. Vikings. Oh, the, okay. I know the uh, costumer, the costume director for that show was like, I did all this research. I wanted to be so period accurate, strictly so. I wanted to bring these the Vikings back to life. And yeah. everyone is wearing a Victorian era Viking interpretation. You know, the Viking theater of the Victorian era. Uh, yeah, with it's the, like the, the horns and the leather and it's just gaudy, awful garbage. And then interpersing that with stuff that nobody was interpreting and it's like it's it's like medieval being interpreted as only king arthur but like what they wrote in like the 1700s of king arthur yeah which is (laughs) weird it's just which also is a kind of a weird like a little uh hallelujah moment not a hallelujah Mm -hmm. moment but you know i'm trying to say like a moment that kind of came to me epiphany Mm -hmm. where because we we for the smf did two uh king arthur scenarios however Mm -hmm. Isn't King Arthur supposed to be a fifth century Welsh story? And yeah. yet we were doing like 17th century knights and stuff. Yeah, it's uh, that's like the so like that when the story became popularized is the time period that like, it seems to have been set as opposed to when it actually fifth, was supposed to be. Yeah, like the fifth century didn't even have any knights. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, barring the fantasy stuff, obviously it's King Arthur. You're going to have fantasy mm-hmm. elements because that was the story. Same. You're going to have the same elements of Robin Hood if you do Robin Hood, but um, which is yeah. weird because we put Robin Hood in there too. But um, uh, I don't yeah. know. It, that was always just kind of like a looking back. I'm like, wait a minute. Um, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, I don't know. Would anybody even recognize it as King Arthur if we did that's fifth the century thing. Welsh? Yeah. Yeah, it's that's the problem when you're trying to do a show that's supposed to be entertainment for an audience is and that's the same thing with cosplay. If someone doesn't recognize who you are, then it's you're not going to get the same reaction. You're not going to get the same entertainment value. That's like so doing kilts for Scots when they didn't yeah. wear kilts. Exactly. Um, exactly. Otherwise, people are just going to be confused because they, they just don't know enough. Yeah, it's like oh. yeah. Sometimes the accent just doesn't come across. They're like, are you just, mm-hmm. are you just gargling? Yeah, or... and this is this is advice I've given to people who do lane acting improv before for can like because uh, at MetroCon the anime convention, our masquerade has improv lane acting in it, mm-hmm. and I tell them that, and I'll tell medieval fairs people who are doing that sort of improv, you're 
you need to be recognizable for who you are, at least roughly, like yeah. well, your station in society, a bit of your personality from a distance. Mm-hmm. Y- you need to you need to make a statement about who you are. And when the resources of what someone in that time period would have looked like or worn or done, it can be very hard to distinguish yourself from other people. Props. Props are key, guys. Yes. So many props. <laughs> Yeah, no, props oh. definitely help. Um, obviously, with a king, you're not going to know it's a king unless they were in a crown. Same exactly. with a queen. Uh, you know, because fabric, we kind of genderize and stationize fabric in the modern society as well as in reenactment. But really, if you had access to it, you'd wear it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah like uh, the, I'm sure the person who was sewing the fancy clothes had a little bit. Uh, like use the leftover fancy fabric yeah. as well and, and you know i'm talking about like purple yeah you know, purple is not as uncommon as people want it to be mm-hmm. so or like you know how the vikings are always interpreted as like muddy always like yeah purple. it's, it's you gotta, yet, they're the ones that are wearing all the bright colors yeah you gotta you gotta look like aragorn otherwise you don't seem medieval enough you gotta, yes <laughs> yes if a if a tolkien wouldn't wouldn't think twice looking at you then you're you know exactly yeah, mm-hmm. I know my my biggest advice for someone who's like, okay, I I don't have a ton of time and energy to put into a recreation outfit. What should I focus on the most to make it as authentic looking as possible with like the most cost benefit is to get the appropriate fabric. And that can be very hard when all you have is one Joanne's spanning three counties. Uh yes. and uh but um Getting the best fabric choice possible mm-hmm. that can, and, and making an informed fabric choice, yeah, that can be worth it to get the more expensive fabric or order online, order your swatches, take extra time to do that because the shape you make can be the same as someone else is wearing. But if your fabric choice is more appropriate, for what you're looking at, you will look a ten times more authentic than the person standing next to you who made a poor fabric choice. You don't have it's, to do ten thousand details. You don't have to do the most elaborate thing ever. If you do it something elaborate and your fabric choice doesn't look era appropriate, it's not going to read as well. Yeah, like um, I mean, doing doing a Viking gear for the channel here. You know, I've I've really delved into the types of wool, patterning of wool, how it's made, what natural mm-hmm. colors are, what things look like by dyeing them uh, with dyes that they would have had back then, realizing that they didn't have black, they didn't mm-hmm. have certain colors, you know, the, the darkest they had. Although if you look at tapestries of, say, like uh, King Alfred in the Witten, I'm um, mm-hmm. using that reference because there is a picture of, of Alfred having his wit in, and they mm-hmm. all look like they're wearing black shoes. That's because mm-hmm. black ink works wonderfully. Yeah, that, yeah. But it, yeah. but if you're dyeing leather or fabric, not so much. Um, yeah, when things are all subject to some monk's artistic interpretation, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And even yeah. then, I you know I discovered that monks who would be probably the closest you're going to find to black clothing aren't mm-hmm. actually wearing black because black sheep are actually brown. So yeah. it's intense. But yeah, mm-hmm. no, if you if you put the effort, if you put the passion into what you're doing, whether it's it's reenactment, living history, uh, conven- conventions, which we'll get into in a moment here, mm-hmm. uh, I think that reads better than mm-hmm. if someone just went to, you know, uh, a Halloween party store. Yeah, yeah, like it, it, the quality of your tunic will look so much better. Your basic tunic, it if you you pick the best fabric you can, um, and and just focus on getting that that shape kind of right, mm-hmm. you're you're gonna look so much better. Uh, exactly. As opposed to, because like I've seen that the biggest problem is when people at a fair are trying to do nobility and they make a bad fabric choice. I'm like. Listen, just let me do your fabric shopping. Yeah. All right. It's okay. It's fine. Uh, like it, I'd rather help you look good than, than yeah. not make you. I'd rather you look like one of us than a patron or a mm-hmm. guest. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've, we've had that too. 
Yeah. And they're like, I think the misconception when you're trying to do nobility like that is you need like a highly embroidered silk or something to make it look good. Like, no, not necessarily. You can you can make it look like you are royalty without a royalties budget. But you have to make informed choices. Exactly. I mean, let's let's just take a go a little bit further along in the period uh because i always talk about viking age but uh or or yeah um whatever his name is Mm -hmm. uh vlad the impaler but uh, let's go a little between there you know even still when you're looking at the fabric differences or perhaps the clothing difference between peasants and uh nobility Mm -hmm. specifically nobility uh we'll say we'll say royalty as opposed to like knights or whatever um Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're really not wearing that much different. It's they're just not. That they're wearing it differently. Yes, I, a lot of the stuff I've seen, especially with the earlier medieval, is the compared to like their ladies in waiting, the the queen will have a uh, more elaborate trim, more elaborate accessories, mm-hmm. more elaborate headpieces, um, and possibly like a whole other layer. And no. uh, all the nobility women, like the, all, I focus on the female stuff because it's yeah. so. Which is, is what I want to ask you about in a second. Yeah, the the fullness of the skirts, how much fa- the wider, the more fabric you could have. That was a symbol of wealth and status is mm-hmm. if you have a fuller, longer skirt, the kind that you have the time to pick up off the ground because you're not carrying stuff to work. You're picking, you're holding up your skirts as you walk because you don't have to hold anything in your hands. You're rich. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge status symbol as opposed to you'll see like the, the workers in tapestries and stuff like that. They have a more practical length. It's not touching the ground. It's like ankle length. And it's often tucked up into an apron or tucked up into a waistband because it's, it's working class. You need yeah. to dress according to your job. Yeah. It, everything wasn't. It, even in eras with corsets and things like that, what working people wore, they could move in it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have worn it. They they would have worn it in a way in which they could move. It's not all as weird and restrictive as you might think. Yeah. So speaking of historically, yeah, as well as reenactment crafts for women, because obviously we co-host uh, the War Queen uh, and, and I, mm-hmm. uh, obviously being male. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to wear a dress out into the field. I would actually, I, I this keeps getting brought up, but I would love to have one more and so I can know what it's like to fight in yeah. one that you guys have to yeah, deal with. Yeah, there are, I mean, I've but, seen some like medieval like coats that like for the men that or like went down way farther. Mm-hmm. And uh, the secret is trying to get off the ground and kick your leg all the way yeah. out. <laughs> yes. Because got to me, choreograph that, that in. <laughs> Yeah, to me that's fascinating, and and how you, that that hurdle you guys need to go through in mm-hmm. order to do what we already do, but with such a, a different outfit, even to what is worn today in terms of women's wear. Um, yeah. Obviously, then it was very specifically women's wear, mm-hmm. and uh, today I don't like you know I I don't like gendering fabric or, or outfits yeah. fabric and fabric right, but um, obviously back then, depending on your station, women wore this, men wore that. Um, yeah. It but, was less of that in some ways, as far as like the cut of the the tunic, all they did was change the hemline a little bit. Mm-hmm. They did yeah. not change anywhere near as much as most people think. Yeah. Um, and I will say, like, I would love to do a fight one day again, because there are so many artistic representations of these long skirts for like a working person being gathered up to the knee like in a band or something to work and i'm like i'd love to do a fight like that and yeah. people are like what what's this historical inaccuracy and i'll be like ah ah ah, not actually this is yeah. real like to me it's the it would be i'm all about trying different experiences and perceptions yeah. within what we do mm-hmm. so i may never be able to do that for our show but i would love to to see what it's like to have to fight like that because Fighting in a full-length other, monk robe. <laughs> and, and the wimple. And I mean, that's just an experience I will never have doing the show that I think everyone should have to have an appreciation and an understanding mm-hmm. of what your, yeah. your, your co-reenactors have to go through. Yeah, like I'd but, love to figure, like I've never fought in 
armor before because mm-hmm. it's it's just never made sense. It is possible for like female characters to do that in certain yeah. certain settings, but even in a fantasy way, I I haven't done that before, and that that would be interesting sometime. Mm-hmm. And and of course, uh, obviously, uh, in regards to reenactment and conventions or cosplay, mm-hmm. we'll say. Um, I did have a quick question, which is a callback from a couple episodes ago when Mm -hmm. the work and I were discussing um, clothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, So obviously we don't have the experience of wearing a dress. And I know our show, the previous that we've previously done, there's like this one type of dress, which kind of looks, it's an underdress with an overdress that I, I, I'm blanking because obviously my ignorance, I'd never looked it up, but um. I don't know if that's even historically accurate. The one that Dan yes. always made. Is that like it one is. accurate? Yeah. And is that something that is like very simple? Like literally really simple mm-hmm. to just kind of put together like a like a tunic? Yeah. Um, maybe not for once you get a lot like later on. Um, but definitely like 15th century stuff like that. Then things start to change okay. shape. So but, like 15th century down? Yeah. Uh, I might even be some of the 14th where but as far okay. as the the basic like tea tunic look and then extending mm-hmm. it down that is very accurate i mean the only thing that you could do to enhance it to make that more accurate is fitting it up in a couple of different ways there might be some detail you could put in here or there but as far as if you do that you are actually very accurate like you would normally have your your underdress would be your linen not necessarily always your linen shift, mm-hmm. but it it kind of would be. It would be your undergarment, and a lot of times, especially like it would be a color. Like you can dye yeah. that a color, and then your over one can be short sleeved. Like I saw a lot of tapestries and different paintings and manuscripts where that one is actually short sleeved. Like you'll have a longer one, but that's your your under, and then a mm-hmm. short sleeve one on top, and that can that can really work it's a very yeah. flex as far as like a most flexible within the time periods garment yeah oh, that's uh, cool because i mean obviously for 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 guys there's mm-hmm. the kind of like a paper cutout of the tea tunic you can hand around and be like there you go or or the typical mm-hmm. tabard um, yeah it's a rectangle with a hole in it um you know that that is always getting passed around but i see all of our, our wonderful uh cast members who are women and have to wear you know have to wear a dress Mm -hmm. and um, and they all wear like the same dress and i'm like is that is that a thing is this is this like every single year we do different we do different years yeah yeah as far as like especially with peasant women like there is i think differences in the way the neckline might have been cut or whether or not the sleeves might have been buttoned up or gathered up um it, or you, there's like the um, the curdles where it's woven up the front of there to fit it even more to your to your chest. But mm-hmm. yeah, the barring those couple of details that fluctuate between those time periods, it is it makes a lot of sense why it is done that mm-hmm. way. Um, yeah. So if you're if you're like, oh, I want to make my my outfit more historically accurate than just that, guess what? It's not too crazy. All you have to do is look up, okay, I want this time period's specific neckline, or this one's specific sleeve gather, or this one's specific uh, gathering style for the uh, like length of their surcoat. It, it's not a big detail difference to take it that extra mile to historical reenactment levels, yeah, no, which is no, like... very encouraging for everyone. Like it's It's not that wild to take yeah. it from one step to another. Yeah, if you um, notice, at least I think with clothing, everything mm-hmm. is kind of very simple. Um, not the weird X dough marks that you see on Hollywood, but I mean, like like the Viking pillbox hat I'm trying to make is is only three pieces of fabric, and it's mm-hmm. just it's just a hat. You know, it's very easy. A tea tunic is very easy. Uh, people don't realize that the historical stuff really is probably the simplest, probably the easiest route to do. Even a turn shoe can just be one piece of leather. Um, yeah. It's just folding it together. And, uh, and, and go ahead. Oh, no, I think the best like base of knowledge for why it is so simple is 
knowing that it it was all based on the width of a bolt of fabric. It isn't like nowadays where you want to have where having things like pieced together is not a thing that's done with modern sewing. It's considered, oh wow, you you ran out of fabric, you didn't cut it right. If you have to piece a piece of it together, no, that is even up through the Victorian era, that is super normal to just make mm-hmm. use of whatever cuts of fabric you happen to have. Um, and to not have the time to super fit something to someone and to need it to be baggier on them because they have to move around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, leading into, of course, uh, we'll, we'll, our discussion mm-hmm. of reenactment crafts, as uh, I'll go ahead and title the episode, because that's our, that's our main mm-hmm. topic here. Um, obviously, you do conventions. I did two Harry Potter conventions with the, the SMF group, but I also mm-hmm. did a convention up in Disney, uh, yeah. which was not a historical or anything of that nature. But um, cosplay is the leading thing, it seems, for, for conventions. Uh, mm-hmm. What is probably probably the best cosplay you've done so far that's completed? Oh, gosh. Uh, that would actually be Violet Evergarden, because I had an extra year to work on it. Uh, mm-hmm. It was more complicated than I would have chosen for myself at the time, because okay. it's got... The front of it is all pleat. It's it's this pleated skirt that you don't realize is pleated in the show until she jumps in one episode and you're like, wait, those weren't those weren't just lines. Yeah. The entire front panel is pleats that are like sewn in place all the way until you get to her her hips and then it fans out and you're like, oh my god. I had to hey. figure out how to integrate a, a zipper into a bustle. And I was Oof. chosen for this one because I was casting her for the fight show. Oh, yeah! I'm taking a look. At, I'm looking at I'm looking at her here in uh, obviously Google. Um, don't use a Google, but um, uh, yeah, that looks intense. I would, you yeah. know, I'd cry. I would cry with the dress. I I, had to do that. I was so determined. I'm like, this was it was my first time last year being cast in chess match for mm-hmm. Metrocon. Um, and I'm like, I'm I'm not I'm going to do this character justice. And normally you have about three months to make a costume if you're in the show between yeah. casting and the actual event uh the only great thing to come out of 2020 was i had extra time to make the blasted thing yeah, uh go. i actually made the petticoat for it um i had to make extra room in the shoulders so i could fight thankfully the fighting i knew i was doing isn't it wasn't super complicated um i was definitely more of a, a speaking character in some bits of it uh, but I did have to like, you know, hit the ground and do stuff what, in that. What kind of weapon does she use? Cause I'm pictures I'm seeing a claw. Uh, she's got, she's got, um, metal prosthetic hands that are like mechanical hands. And, uh, like she's a like full metal alchemist. Yeah. Uh, honestly, uh, like the era that it's in is more like world war one ish. So she okay. actually, they're like, Hey Angela, what weapon would she fight with in chess match? I'm like, you know, a gun, but we can't really do that. Mm-hmm. You, <laughs> um, have a, you have a, you a, have a wider array. Yeah. So I just did, um, I just did hand to hand and cause I knew I could like block weapons with my metal hands. Yeah. Um, I used paintball gloves and, uh, leather to make it look mechanical like that um right. and so i could hit things and people without one breaking the gloves or two breaking the person mm-hmm. which uh, <laughs> sometimes always a plus yep uh, yep uh, but uh, that's other, cool yeah there were other materials i could have used if i was just doing this purely for cosplay that would have made it the the hands look better mm-hmm. but for the purposes i was doing there's that but yeah this is a that is my greatest achievement is the awesome. patterning i did all the patterning myself nice. um this was the most hand sewing ever done in my life because there were so many intricate parts of it where trying to put this through the, the sewing machine it wouldn't have really worked you have to know like if you're getting into cosplay valuing your hand sewing for finishing certain aspects of it that will be incredibly frustrating to try to use a sewing machine for i tell you it may seem like it's going to take longer to hand sew it, but it actually isn't. It's going to be know, so much I, easier. I love the idea of sewing mm-hmm. and uh, many, many years doing the show that we do. Even beforehand, I would try to use a sewing machine. And like our costume mm-hmm. director had to help me with the King Alfred outfit because my sewing machine just kept uh, 
tensing yeah. up. Jamming up. Yep. You know? Yeah. And I even even she would go through the whole thing, break it down, put it back together, and still do it. It would tense mm-hmm. up. And I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to, yeah. you know, I'm just, now that I'm getting back into it, uh, I don't have a sewing machine. I don't want one. I'm just going to hand sew everything. But, yeah. you know, everything I'm doing is medieval stuff. So they kind of did sense. it anyway. Right? Yeah. Um, I I enjoyed learning a lot more about hand sewing and getting a lot more comfortable with it. Uh, I'd say from like Bernadette Banner's videos on YouTube. Mm-hmm. She does a lot more of like the, the more Victorian area dress history yeah. stuff. But, uh, Opethel uh, and I is wonderful as well, as well as the Welsh Viking. Welsh oh, Viking yes. does periodic sewing videos uh opus l and i is incredible absolute chill aesthetic Mm -hmm. yeah uh as far as like learning okay so for this type of seam this one needs to be super reinforced so i'll take the extra time to backstitch or this seam it's not going to have that much tension on it you can just running stitch it and save yourself some time but knowing where you can save time with hand sewing based on the type of seam it is like what type of stress it'll be under that can really save you time and stress is learning more about that yeah uh definitely helps um, yeah and and i think this this december i'll go ahead and finally gain up the courage to cut that fabric and uh my thing is i don't want to mess it up um because it's such a, it's just a yard of not even a yard of fabric but mm-hmm. um I'll, I'll get that figured out but anywho uh yeah. let's go ahead and close That's... it up of course we're hitting the hour sure. mark and uh of course so just a quick final question then in regards mm-hmm. to cosplay. So yeah. when you're doing Violet Evergarden, you have a wider array, considering the time frame. obviously it's closer to modern, mm-hmm. uh, a wider selection of things. But is there a specific guideline with that character that I have mm-hmm. no clue about? Obviously, I've never yeah. watched that anime. Um, for her outfit that you had to stick by, like, say, for medieval, you have you, you can only use this fabric. For, for say, whatever, like a futuristic character, you got all of this. But if, if you're just doing like a World War One setting, uh, what is available to her that you would be able to utilize? And did you mm-hmm. be able to kind of narrow that down for yourself to use for a more accurate outfit? I know when you're analyzing any character you're trying to recreate from a, any TV show, mm-hmm. uh, looking at how the person moves in it, you have to be like, okay, so they need to be able to do this in this fabric. Also, do I think it's got a sheen to it or do I think it's got more matte? Um, I used cotton sateen fabric for her dress. I could have used, like, quilting cotton would have been the closest I could have used for that. But I happened upon, in an amazing quilt shop that normally doesn't stock this kind of thing, uh, a fabric that looked very luxurious because she's supposed to look like I knew that she's supposed to be referred to as looking like a China doll. So uh, I I stayed away from the shinier polyesters except for the lining of the jacket because the jacket is fully lined because I'm insane. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, making sure you're lining things that need lined is something that's going to set a an outfit apart. Like if your woolen tunic normally would have been lined in linen for comfort do it trust me it's a it, it will it will look more substantial it will have it like, include all your lining layers and all that uh, like breaking down and analyzing something for a show is not that different than breaking down and analyzing historical garb um and just the hunt for finding the perfect fabric or the the perfect material Um, and if that perfect material that looks correct doesn't have the right drape, do I need to layer it up with something? Do I need to line it to make it stiffer or something like that is honestly fiber, fiber knowledge of fiber art and fiber craft is the backbone of both worlds. And the more you know about that, the better choices you're going to be able to make that will Save you time and frustration and set your work apart. Uh, yeah, like I said, if you sew the exact same shape of thing and you make a better choice of the material you're working with, it'll leave some bounce better. Yeah, I'm trying that at the moment with, uh, mm-hmm. well, obviously the Viking thing, but uh, I, I've found, because I'm trying to get into cosplay as well, although mm-hmm. I haven't taken any pictures yet, but um, I've got a 
a Legacy cosplay, if you know Beastars. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Beastars, Legacy. Uh, I don't know why I chose Leaf's, uh, Legacy, but you know, for some reason, I like the show. Yeah. Uh, and there's no theme here, but also Baron from The Cat Returns. Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. top hat cat. And um, obviously, you, since you know me personally, uh, doing Harry Potter stuff, obviously a Hogwarts student from Slytherin, I realized mm -hmm. those three characters all kind of wear the same thing. Yeah, and yeah. You're getting into some some uh, tailoring techniques uh, going forward, even just making a vest for Legacy or something like that, depending mm -hmm. on what he's wearing. Make sure you get it lined. Yeah. Uh, Actually, weirdly, fortunately enough, because they all kind of wear the same thing, I was mm -hmm. able to get everything off of Etsy. Yeah. Um, with the exception of Legacy's leggings, his his pants, because those are yeah. unique to Beatstars. Um, that that I actually don't have yet, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to. I, I don't want to buy the the cosplay version, which is yeah. on like, Amazon, which is like here's the cheap Party City Legacy outfit. Yeah. But if yeah. I have to, just for pictures, uh, I guess. But um. That's yeah, the only thing that I've been having an issue with. Yeah, even just like altering something you find at a thrift store, like you find the right color of pants and you yeah. just learn how to tailor them to yourself to the, get the right fit. That can be great. There's there is yes. nothing wrong with that. You do not have to start from scratch for cosplay or anything. One one yeah. thing I did have to do for Legacy, um, I don't know what your your knowledge of Beastars is, but mm -hmm. obviously I did research for this furry character. But um, mm -hmm. his outfit, what he's wearing. So they're wearing a school uniform, which mm -hmm. is the same kind of outfit that both a, a Slytherin mm -hmm. student would be wearing, as well as, ironically enough, Baron from The Cat Returns, yeah. a little statue cat. Um, but but Legacy has the overall straps, you know, the mm -hmm. belt straps. But his clip is different than the other two. His huh. clip is like a little triangle clip that's actually sewn to the pants. Mm -hmm. And I have to actually find the right pair of pants and then sew those into the pants somehow. Yeah. So I, I will have to make modifications to do that. So that's a little different thing. Whereas the other two, honestly, it was really easy to just kind of piece together doing some Etsy shopping because Eat. the stuff they're wearing is modern, obvious clothing. But that's yeah. the only thing that I've needed to adjust. The 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 rabbit holes you'll find yourself diving down skill set wise when you decide mm -hmm. to do any type of costuming or dear God cosplay, uh, you have to be open to just learning a new skill a year. Yeah. <laughs> to be like I found through cosplay, every costume I choose, I have to be just accepting that I'm just going to have to learn a whole dang new skill. I may not be perfect at it, but I'm going to have to do research on learning one new skill per costume. And this sometimes sometimes it's not even reenactment crafts. Like yeah. I've got a, I got a, a four panel shoji wall and ah. for the five years that I've owned it, not a single scratch from Callie. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I get a, another cat and one of those panels is hanging by a thread. So uh, uh, it's an easy fix. You just it's mm -hmm. it's learning a new trade, but um, that's yeah. that's a good. That, that's yeah. pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, why I like that the cosplay and reactive stuff has become more and more popular is because it is challenging people who would not have normally tried new crafts or new crafting skills of any kind. Mm -hmm. No matter what aspect happens to suit your fancy, you just constantly challenging yourself to be learn one craft more intensely or try a different craft you never thought you would be into um but learn mm -hmm. the basics of it exactly. having that mentality of that's cool that's fine it's not something that only someone in this field doing it for a living should learn that you don't have to want to do this for a living to learn these crafts and yeah. want that to be a part of your skill set is I think the greatest benefit to it. Exactly. I mean, people can learn so much both historically, but also, you know, creatively. And I think mm -hmm. putting art into the world, whether it's making clothing, crafts, you know, leather work or painting is, mm -hmm. is really what people should be doing. But let's go ahead and close that out. Of course, it's been a wonderful talking to you. I've been Thank going you. down our, our personal history in regards to what we do, as well as mm -hmm. delving into some new topics of, of, uh, reenactment crafting but yeah uh, until next time of course 
we need to talk more about other things uh, that we it's, it's literally a list of all the stuff we do that mm-hmm. we can just fill hours of that we already do when we're oh, all yeah. together. It may as well. Mm-hmm. Um, until then, I, of course, am the host, uh, NC, and our wonderful guest. Uh, Angel Rodenfels, uh, Dreamforged Cosplay, if you're uh, looking for me at a convention. Do you have an Etsy or anything like that? Or, or I do not have an Instagram Etsy that you do? at this time. Uh, I do have an Instagram, Dreamforged Cosplay. Uh, you can see uh, all the works that I've done the past few years are detailed there. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, there you go. And then that is that for this episode of the Talk Past podcast. Here's at the start of uh, the new year. You enjoy the day.